everyone. So welcome to this uh, last session of the Linux Security Summit North America, our uh, first time ever virtual. And um, this is our panel session, and we had one panel session already yesterday. And uh, today's panel has the same topic as yesterday, so if you have attended to yesterday one, um, you have might be already started to think about uh, the questions you want to ask, so feel free to start asking them already now. And uh, I, have, I have not had much time to think since yesterday about the um, how to improve this and make it more interactive. And we decided that one way to make it would be that uh, as the questions come in, the panel members could pick a question each of them like, and we can make a small round table also for the panel members, which just randomly picking questions of the interest. So, but with that, let me introduce first uh, our panel members. Let's um, let's give them like small virtual round table, so which each panel member can introduce uh, himself or herself and say maybe a few words about uh, them. So we will start with like people appearing here on the screen. So Andy, you will be the first one. Hi everyone. I'm Andy Ludomirsky. I've been working on the Linux kernel for a while now. I mostly do x86 stuff, and I do some security stuff and some code review. And hopefully I solve more problems than I cause. Thank you, Andy. Uh, next would be Christian. Uh, I'm Christian. I work on the Linux kernel as well, surprisingly, um, for not as long as Andy has been. Thank you, Christian. Uh, Dmitry? Uh, hello, my name is Dmitry Vyukov. I work as software engineer at Google. Uh, for the past five years, our team is working on bug detection tools for the kernel, in particular address sanitizer, which finds use after freeze and out of bounds access. Also recently, a memory sanitizer, which finds uses of initialized data, and concurrency sanitizer, which finds data races. Uh, also, we are working on kernel fuzzer, and in particular on the notorious syscaller fuzzer, which is coverage-guided uh, structure where kernel fuzzer, and on the sysbot, which is high-level automation for, for the fuzzer, uh, which does continuous fuzzing, uh, automatic bug reporting, and bug tracking. And it has found thousands of bugs in the Linux kernel and in some other operated system kernels. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitry. Emily, with the mic. I'm hearing a lot of echo now, so I think somebody needs to mute their phone. All right, thank you. So I'm Emily Ratliff. Um, my professional career in Linux security started about 19 and a half years ago when I was one of the first two people to join the core Linux security team in IBM's Linux uh, Technology Center. Um, I worked on the first common criteria evaluations, the first trusted computing enablement for Linux, and for the security architecture uh, for IBM's first public cloud. Um, I've worked on secure boot for AMD's Mullins chip, uh, I've worked on the core infrastructure initiative and with the Ubuntu security team. Most recently, I rejoined IBM, working for uh, IBM security to get a view of the world um, as from security as an application perspective. Mm -hmm. Throughout my career, I've worked at all levels of hardware and software with a focus on open source and open standards. And back to you. Thank you, Emily. And, and last but not least, Naina. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Naina Jain. I work as software engineer in the Linux security team of IBM Cognitive Systems. My regular work involves enabling secure and trusted boot on power systems. My most of the work in kernel has been mainly related to IMA, TPM, and the key management. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. So uh, I'm Elena. So I have not changed my workplace, my very interest since yesterday. So I'm going to skip my intro in the sake of time. So let's let's really get to the panel itself. So I want to first start by recapping for people who hasn't attended the panel yesterday or 
and by the way, you can still, you can already watch it or watch it anytime you want because everything is already available. But just a couple of points I wanted to recap, which we basically spent most of the time talking in yesterday panel. And the first point, which I think we spent most of the time was really about testing and testing in the terms of our Linux kernel testing and more like lack of testing in the Linux kernel. So, which has been kind of um, given as the reason for many of the bugs we have, which have been called out, so that we have a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of bugs reported for each release, including regressions bugs, and a lot of discussion went into how can we improve testing, uh, how do we make sure that the, test, the code which gets into kernel actually has the test pages to go with them. So, there was a lot of speculation around that. That was the first point. Another point was, uh, um, maybe I could kind of summarize it as some lack of focus on the user space. So uh, the point um, which was brought that uh, we focus nowadays a lot on the kernel security and we kind of completely or greatly forgotten the user space, this link of the user space, how all of it integrates and quite often some security decisions are pushed into the user space thinking that all the users will figure it out. Uh, but then what users tend to choose is that they they don't figure it out, so they kind of the end result is, is is not very good. And of course, performance attached to no surprise. So performance security, long-lived friends. Um, I really like the, uh, Jan's point yesterday about this um, turning security issues into fixable performance problems. I, I I really like that idea, but I just don't know like how long. If I try to propose something like this to my interns, like Andy, if I'm proposing something like this to you, saying, "Oh, here is a great security patch." Uh, for your subsystem, it just creates this big performance problem, but this is a simple one, so we know that your maintainer, you can fix it. So I don't know if this, I might not have too long time to leave on the mailing list. So. But I, 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 I really like Jan's idea about it. Then there was many other points also discussed, but I think this was kind of one of the main ones. Uh, also, um, Mimi talked about this importance of understanding with trust for how, how the trust applies for different things in the context of integrity subsystems. So how it's important to kind of differentiate and, and understand, or like especially for the packaging and files um, origin. And then we had also Brad's talk today um, where he gave his view on what he thinks uh, Linux security should be doing in the, I don't know, next 10 or so, so years. So I guess we can also start discussing some of that. But now, before we go into question and answers mode, so I will uh, give again, we will make another small round table so that each panel member can bring the points which they consider important and which they, they want to bring with regards to kind of the current problems in Linux security and what should we be doing about it. So we will start it in the same order as we started the introduction. Um, so Andy, if you could start. Oops, hi. Um, yeah, I definitely, I think testing is particularly important and not just testing, but making sure people actually run the tests, which some of you, especially this caller, are excellent at. Um, but there's writing tests, running tests, making sure that they run recently. I'm currently chasing a security bug that's embargoed that embarrassingly we have a test for, and the test has been failing for several months and nobody noticed. So we definitely have a lot of room for improvement in the kernel. Um, I don't know quite what the user situation is. That involves a lot of coordination with distros. It's a little bit hard to pull off. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Christian? Christian, I think you're muted. So maybe we can go to Dmitry. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? So I'm actually going to repeat all of the same, roughly. So I'm going to talk about uh, bugs, testing, and quality. Uh, there are lots of bugs in every kernel release, literally tens of thousands. And lots of them affect security in some ways, like memory corruptions or information leaks. And security is the weakest link problem. 
So logical protections like security modules, containers, integrity, and even users and permissions, they can be compromised by memory corruption. Uh, then all of those, those things like CVs are not working or not being filed or fixes not being backported to stable or vendors are not updating their kernels. Uh, I think major reason for those is simply a very large number of bugs and fixes. Uh, you can file CVEs if you have, say, 10 or maybe 100 of bugs, but if you, if you have 20,000 of bugs, you can't do CVEs anymore. It's just too much work. And vendors are not updating their kernels uh, because they're not able to keep up, and it's not their fault, I think. So you, you can imagine doing few security fixes per month. Uh, that's a reasonable rate. Uh, but if you look at, say, 4.14 release, that's almost uh, 20 patches per day for the past two and a half years, like every day without weekends, or 550 patches each month. And it's not even full number. We know that patches have been dropped if, if they don't apply clearly. And Brad just told us that we missed more than a thousand of fixes. Uh, so I'm not surprised that nothing wo works well at this rate. And this just doesn't look right. Uh, for the most security critical infrastructure project in the world. Uh, I think we need to reduce number of bugs per release to orders of magnitude to make situation manageable and to make those security processes even possible. Uh, so what should we do about this? Uh, I think we need to make testing and quality integral part of the development process and of the project and not try to push it to some third parties or users and wait when they will do this. So users, uh, end users are very bad uh, testers. They don't necessarily see bugs. They don't use debugging tools. They don't report bugs most of the time. And they don't test any corner cases. Um, so for the project, it should uh, include things like policies, like developers need to test with new, function, uh, with new functionality at regression tests for bug fixes. And drivers need to be testable. Uh, because if they can only be tested with real hardware, it means they are not tested on CIs, they are not tested by developers, they are not tested during stable process. Uh, then static analysis need to be integrated into sentient patches, and we need green light for people deploying new static analyzers. Uh, we also need more SN and tooling and automation. Uh, because at this scale, something that can be automated and needs to be done manually, it simply won't be done at all. And that's what we see with testing. Uh, so this requires unified formats for tests and unifying all aspects of tests, actually, like prerequisites, output, output formats, how to run them. In particular, that means also that developers need to stop inventing their own test frameworks and systems on the site. Uh, and also things like unified crash reporting, because currently, say, you can you can run tests, but you won't be able to understand if kernel crashed or not in, in an automated way. And in particular, this complete, such complete automation and unification is the reason why a sysbot is so effective. Uh, so it may appear that I'm asking to kind of do more work and increase costs, but actually good testing in automation in the end, it significantly reduces cost of development because we don't need to chase bugs, we don't need to fix regressions again and again, and we don't need to do the small follow-up fixes for static analysis warnings and so on. So that's my view and thank you. Thank you, Dmitry. Uh, okay. so uh, let's go to Emily next. I don't know if Christian, we, we will return to you at the end of the sure. round. Oh, are you actually here? I am here. Christian. Oh, okay. So maybe we can go to you back. So then now, before we lock you again. I hope I'm not breaking off again. I'm sorry. This is Germany's internet, I tell you. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I was uh, expecting that Dimitri would cover all of the technical details with syscaller and so on. Uh, uh, Christian, I guess we lost you again. Okay, so maybe Emily, let, let, let's go to you. Let's hope it repairs. 
All right. Let's let's hope this is more more stable. Um, as, so as I mentioned in my in my introduction, it's been quite some time since I worked on the Linux kernel. So I wanted to take this opportunity to give uh, my three wishes for the broader Linux security e ecosystem beyond beyond the kernel. Um, I, I really enjoy coming to these things and hearing the latest of the innovative solutions coming out in, in the Linux kernel. Um, and my, it brings me great hope and optimism, which lasts until October when you know, we engage in Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And I find out that once again, the latest uh, state of the art advice for end users is to not click on links, right? So it makes me wonder, you know, are, are we really making progress? So when I think about the future of Linux security, um, I think about how uh, the path of code to the user, um, you, the, the paths are just proliferating. So in the past, we've had um, the Linux distros be a curation point where uh, users expected them to, uh, to uh, determine which are the most usable and most useful uh, open source security projects. Um, that may have been an iffy proposition. Some, uh, some, um, distros did more curation and some did less, but they were st still commonly considered a, a curation point. And now with, you know, all of the different ways of Docker containers and, and, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, there's there's many more ways through, and so one of the big problems is how open source projects signal to each other uh, that they are doing the uh, that they're developing with uh, the security in mind, and uh, so the Linux Foundation did create the the badging app, and it is still ongoing. Um, it's been ongoing for for the past uh, four years, and this past month, curl and the Linux. Uh, curl and the, the the Linux kernel became the fifth and sixth projects to become gold badge. The importance of the project is not necessarily in the badge per se, but as a conduit for uh, the discussion of what makes a secure open source project. Um, so my wish is that you know the the badging app gain uh, more visibility, more projects, and have more people contributing to that discussion. So my second uh, point that I'd like to talk about today is about resources that are out there that are available uh, to open source projects. Um, and so uh, you all may be aware of uh, Mozilla's MOSS program and its associated secure open source uh, program, which funds audits for open source projects that uh, Mozilla and, and Firefox use. Um, but I'd also like to make sure, take this opportunity to make sure you're aware of the Open Tech Fund, which has as a mission uh, secure communications and uh, censorship circumvention. And they also offer, as part of their Red Team Fund, part of the Core Infrastructure Fund, uh, security audits for software that support that mission. And so my second wish for the future of Linux security is that uh, more projects take advantage of, of these. Um, and then the, the, the last thing that I'd like to talk about is um, that even as Linux has really taken over the world, you know, it's in safety critical systems and IoT devices, um, running massive cloud infrastructures, knowledge of Linux security is really not keeping up um, with the widespread proliferation. And especially in the top level, you know, the highest level of, of uh, applications or projects intended for IT security operations, you tend to see these projects coming out with, you know, fully populated uh, information about Windows security. And then with the TBD, yes, we know we need Linux security and that's coming soon. And we we'd really appreciate your contributions. And so my, my third wish for Linux security is that the you know, knowledge of Linux security uh, for end users uh, proliferates much more widely and keeps up with the adoption of, of Linux itself. And so those are my three wishes. Back to you. Thank you, Amy. And Lana? 
Yeah, thanks, Selena. So we had some great discussions in the yesterday's panel, and uh, Mimi Zohar has brought this question on the need of file provenance. And now in today's world, our whole world is evolving around technology. The technology has played a significant role, especially in this time of pandemic, whether it is cloud infrastructure for online shopping, AT&T networks, collaboration tools, or user and devices. Now, and we also heard about a lot of cyber attacks happening this time. So in such a scenario, could file verification would have played a very significant role in building our trust on the softwares or the applications or the firmware which are getting run on these devices or on the infrastructure on which these devices depend on. But now the need of signature verification implicitly brings with it the need of asymmetric public keys. And then the similar question of trust will apply on those keys which are used for verifying these signatures. So in this global world where every device has the firmware stack or application stack, operating system from different vendors, by default, the signers of these different binaries, there are different owners of the keys. So I think in today's discussion, I would mainly like to emphasize on the issues related to key management in context of the kernel. The key management is a full end-to-end -end cycle from creation, provisioning, retention to revocation. And one of the problem I see is how kernel trusts asymmetric public keys, which are not owned or built within the kernel. So I think I'll, I, I first realized this issue while enabling secure boot on open power systems. And in this case, the interesting thing was that our bootloader itself is kernel and the keys for verifying the actual host OS is being owned by firmware. But the kernel do not trust firmware keys because they do not match the trust requirements of existing kernel keylings. So the addition of a new platform keyling resolved this issue by isolating kernel verifying keys from other key keys in other keys in the kernel and was used only for kernel verification. But this was a small step that was used only for the purpose of uh, using firmware key for the kernel verification. And there's still an issue on how to how does the kernel trust the keys from various other layers if those are not signed with built-in keys. So is there a possibility where kernel can trust something from outside and load the keys dynamically? Is there another root of trust which we can depend on, like trusted hardware or other external key management servers? How does the kernel trust any external source? And then additionally, how do we ensure that the, our keys are getting, do, having the relevant checks which are needed as per the X509 specs or any, or any of these specs? And then is the revocation of keys happening uh, as needed? Is it handled sufficiently or are we even doing it sufficiently? So I think these are the main issues which I would like to get discussed in today's call. And, and then I would like to say that most of these issues we are seeing in server domain and there are people here from various other domains like IoT embedded containers. So it would be interesting to know what type of problems they are facing in the similar uh, context and then we can see how can we come up with a flexible solution in the kernel for handling the key management issues. So thanks, Elena. And, uh, Thank you, Nana. So, Christian, are you able to talk now? Or? Um, maybe not. Okay, so start. But, um, okay, so this has been our round table. And actually, like, usually nothing goes as planned. So by the time the round table in yesterday's panel has finished, they had already in the queue like millions of questions. Now I can only see two of them. So at least it looks like I can encourage people to ask more questions. You get actually a chance to being answered this time because it's much less in general. And they have this very bad background now. I wonder where is that coming from. Oh, I think it's got better. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, since we have only two questions here, so uh, I can ask these questions to the panel. 
And then we'll see how, how we go from there. So the first question is actually on the security and crypto. So uh, the question is security and crypto subsystem seems quite a, far apart. It causes things like key management being artificially split in two. For example, there's no easy way to accommodate crypto acceleration of encrypted keys. And the TPM doesn't count because it's slow. And this means that most of the times the keys are lying around in the plain text. So the question to your panel members, how do you see this situation improving? Does anyone want to comment on this? I can take it. Sure. Uh, okay, so I think that there are basically two points here. Uh, what I'm saying is one is related to the crypto acceleration. So if I'm understanding the question right, there is one thing is like whether do you offload the computation to the crypto accelerators. And the second thing is the keys are lying around in plain text. So can we use the crypto accelerators or the probably hardware security modules for the crypt, uh, for storing those keys so i think uh, uh if you see the latest work which has been happening so there was cpm being used for encrypted keys that was for symmetric keys and uh, there has been recently some patches in area of trusted execution environment to use that for the encrypted keys so i think people are trying to use no more on the trusted hardware site for encrypted keys but uh, which is like symmetric keys and i think that is the same point now can we how can we use them for asymmetric keys also so i say the situation is improving i think with more and more secure hardware type of things coming up now there are more people try people will be trying to they use them for the uh and there are patches coming around uh probably as there are different varieties of hardware might come there might be a need of a generic layer which can be talk transparently uh, undo the underlying thing and more will we can see around in this in the kernel. Thank you, Nana. Does anyone else want to comment on this? We move to the next question. Okay, so let's do the question. Next question is in very different areas. So, next question are uh, Did the Linux kernel really meet the 80% statement test coverage required for the CI Silver Gold badge? It seems unlikely other frameworks, uh, for example, PSMMM would place the Linux kernel at the end of the maturity lever journey. I don't know what this PSIMM is, but... I, I can take this question. So one of, one of the nice things about the, uh, the badge app is that uh, the evidence is made public as, as, as the questions get answered. And so if you go to the badge app and you look at the entry for the Linux kernel, um, it, uh, that's actually one of the unmet criteria. Uh, it's with the comment Linux tests, kernel tests individual feature functionality, not code branches, and is generally only new features, not older POSIX-like functionality. And so the lack of meeting that criteria did not prevent it from getting to the gold badge. Uh, so you don't have to match everything in order to get to the 300% level to get to the, to the gold badge. And it, I mean, it's entirely possible that other maturity models wouldn't agree uh, uh, to, uh, to that level. Uh, that's the beauty of having different, uh, different maturity models. And it's also the beauty of uh, the Linux badge app or, or the the CII badge app program, you can go in there and have the debate about whether or not it should get that gold badge without that 80% coverage. I also have, have an answer. Uh, so I, I am not working on CI systems, but last September I asked um, all main CIs like kernel CI, CKI, LKFT about kernel coverage, code coverage, and none of them had any infrastructure to even collect coverage. So I suspect the answer is that nobody really knows what is the coverage. Uh, and so I know some some number, some coverage numbers for syscaller. Um, it's somewhat hard to assess because we, we work on the compiler level, not necessarily statement level, and we don't cover, say, init functions and Say, if you're testing on the x86 architecture, how do you count other architectures? Do, do you need to take them uh, in the total number of statements or not? Uh, 
Uh, but I get a number somewhere around 8%. So Sysbot covers about 8% of statements that were compiled into the kernel. Uh, but one remark here is that, as it was mentioned yesterday, Sysbot actually doesn't do any testing of the kernel in the traditional sense. It only tests for basic safety violations. For example, if you create a socket and the kernel instead delete all of your files, that's perfectly fine with Sysbot, like it didn't crash. Um, so there's, I mean, there's also different degrees of coverage, like what does it mean to be covered by what tests? Do you think that's it? Anyone else wants to comment on this one? And I hope you're not leaving us since we're moving. No, I'm still here, just getting out of the sun. Okay, so if no one wants to comment on this one, let's move to the next um, question. Oh, I if you can hear me. Yes. I would want. I would want to. I have a question for Dimitri actually, because we talked about this before. Do you do you feel? Are you happy with the impact you are having right now with Sysbot, Syscaller, and Casey Sun, and so on uh, that you have on on. Uh, Hmm. Am I happy with impact? Uh, to some degree, I would say. So we definitely lots of bugs getting fixed because of our work and that's very nice and I'm happy with that. Uh, on the other hand, I would like tests to be added for the bugs fixed for example, and that's usually not happening in most of the cases. Um, I would also like more bugs to be fixed because we still have, I think now about 600 open bugs. So I don't know, I frankly, it's hard to say if I'm happy or not. Well, I guess mostly yes. There's, there's one bug in the console code that Dimitri, that syscaller keeps hitting every couple days and it keeps sending us reports and nobody's fixed it yet. So someday we'll fix all 600 bugs. So Christian, while, while you're able to speak, so do you want to try to again present your point of view, which you didn't I, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to, and I'm sorry for all the problems I'm causing, but that's what I'm known for. I'm joking. Um, one of the things I, I tried to make a point before is um, that a lot of us as developers may is how it was sold and what. It's breaking again. Maybe you can type your point. <laughs> no, you can try again. Yeah. So it's like starting and it's good. And when, when it just starts breaking. A am I back now? Maybe if you turn yeah. the video, maybe it will help. Now we can just hear someone's typing. And we completely lost Christian, I think. Okay, this this is really the downside of us being virtual. So I'm I'm, I'm truly hoping that next year we can actually make a nice panel with members being live. Christian, are you back or? Yeah, I ch try to be, but I hope. Am I breaking off? No, not. Okay. So we think we always tend to think that, or we used to think that there is inherent conflict between security and performance and performance has traditionally mattered a lot on Linux. And it's good that it matters like that. There's nothing inherently bad about this. Um, but I think this, this false sort of conflict has sometimes held us back. Um, and, and there is another aspect 
we we need people that can tell us i think the difference between security theater as some people like to refer to it and stuff that actually improves the the state of the art of uh, kernel security and i think that is actually a problem we don't have a lot of people that have that can provide the quality of review that is needed uh, across the board for new kernel features and so on that can tell us First of all, this has introduced a significant security bug just based purely on logic analysis. I'm afraid, Christian, you're breaking again. It went so well for so long this time. Can you try again or? It sounds like he is still trying, but I mean, that, that's a discussion that I'd really like to have because I mean, it's one thing to talk about uh, security theater at the kernel level, but then, um, you know, what's important to users as well? Because, I mean, sometimes we spend so much time focused on securing the system that we lose track of. We're still allowing things like um, ransomware, for example, to uh, that, that really impacts the user. Um, and so it, it's not necessarily, you know, all of the security uh, controls functioned, but the user still lost their data. So I think, you know, while we're having that discussion about what's real security and what's, um, what's security theater, we need to focus on the, the goals as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's actually a very good point. And Christian, are you able to continue or? No. Oh. Looks not. Okay, so, no, but I also I agree actually with Christian point that we're getting more reviews and I think Brad has uh, to some degree kind of talked about it today, saying that we don't have enough expertise, for example, like people like Jan Horn who is reviewing patches, but not necessarily like from point of view of just reviewing the patches, but saying that how efficient this special mitigation could be against certain exploits, for example, or against certain threat models. And it's actually not a trivial task to do because it's it's very hard. It's like very easy when we bring a security patch forward. I mean, we can measure its performance and it can be horrible or not horrible or so something in the middle. And it, but it's something very kind of easy to measure. But how when it comes to security, it's very hard to measure how efficient a certain mitigation on. Or I mean, you can say that yes, this this mitigation stopped this particular let's say exploit from working on this particular technique, but it might be even if you close the technique, exploitation technique, where there's very easy way for a person attacking this to just go and try something else. And it's 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 just like it it it's might be even not worth the amount of effort which has been put into it. So I think that's actually really a big problem. So if you could get more reviews uh, from people with exploitation knowledge on the hardening techniques which are being proposed and stuff, I think this would be very valuable. I don't know if, if also, this is the point that Christian was uh, one of his points that he was trying to bring, but um, at least this is my part take on it. So, uh, okay. So, does anyone wants to comment more on this one? Andy, maybe you from the kernel side on this. I don't have anything. I don't have any amazing fixes here. Um, getting people to do code review is hard. It's it's a lot of fun to go and write new code and make things work. And it's not quite as much fun to go sit and read code that you had no direct involvement in and that nobody's paying you to read and to say, let's make this better or let's see if it's already great. So it's a tough thing to recruit for. So, so what do you think from a point of view of, um, because you're kind of representing the kernel community, maybe not so like security related kernel community. So what would make you being more interested in reading, let's say, a new patch series and some security hardening feature? So what should that patch series 
how help us to kind of how, how should we frame this? Start from very strong case, point to existing exploit, or how, how to make it more appealing? Let's say to kernel maintainer. I <clears throat> I think that's hard. I don't have any magic fixes. I think part of it is just recruiting people who find this to be fun. There's there's certainly a community of people who have a lot of fun breaking things. And I think the Google Project Zero people are an example of this. And it would be great to try to recruit more people to see their own role as breaking things in the Linux kernel and maybe even breaking things that haven't been merged yet. But what about back to kind of the maintainer position? I mean, maintainers are usually very loaded. So there are like a lot of features being developed, things like bug fixes and stuff, everything on this tight schedule. And when there is this people coming with some hardening patches or something like that, which might be like, you know, out of your normal cycle and things like people looking. So this is what I was trying to ask, but just how to make, how to make how, how we can kind of frame these patches in a way that making it easier for maintainers to look at them, like finding time to look at the security patches, because in, in many cases, it's ultimately up to maintainers to take certain changes in. I mean, there might be security changes and patches might be proposed, but the maintainers need to find time to look for these patches. And the security patches well, might not be like, you know, these usual ones. So one thing, one thing that's kind of specific to hardening patches, when, when someone sends a patch to enable new hardware or a patch to enable a new feature or a patch to fix a bug, it's, it's very clear what the patch is doing, what the benefit is, why we would want to merge it. When someone sends a patch to harden a little corner of the kernel, sometimes it's a little hard to see how that fits into the big picture. And the, a lot of the patches we see are hardening against certain exploit techniques and I think a lot of the maintainers and a lot of people in general don't have the clearest understanding of when an exploit technique matters. So as an example, right now in the x86 space, we're seeing patches, we just saw patches to harden access to the CR4 register on x86. And I, as a maintainer, don't necessarily have the clearest idea of what precisely we gain by doing this. And it may be we gain a lot, it may be we gain a little, it may be that this plus a few other things in the radar down the road will give us a big advantage, but sometimes it's hard to see what we're actually accomplishing. And clearer descriptions in the patch, maybe feedback from people who are in tune with how exploits are written would help with this. If someone came up and said, hey, I exploited the following bug or would have exploited the following bug using this tech, and this hardening patch would have made a difference, that would be huge. Thank you, Andy. Uh, does anyone want to comment yeah. on this or continue? Yeah, Christian. Yeah, I would like to try to, if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Wow, I called in over the phone. Um, so uh, I, I think Andy is, is pressing a really good point. We have, it, it's like a lot of times when, when I see hardening patches come onto the list, it's like, and they need to explain their threat model and it needs to be clear what is the, the larger benefit for all of the kernel. Is there like really something that we're protecting against or, or is this just, yeah, as I said before, security theater. And I don't, I honestly, and uh, even in, in, in core kernel stuff, I'm not always sure that maintainers or developers of features are the best people to actually, uh, to actually judge, uh, judge this. Um, a lot of time it depends on me see seeing people that are that are have written exploits in in this area for example well in this case my example is obviously Jan, who I always see when when such things come up so we don't really have a community of of uh, of people who know their way around exploits know their way around uh, security and security research and and that's kind of a and that's kind of a problem. And and that's the point I tried to make before in my introductory, introductory statement is in order to push new security features, I think relevant security features, you obviously also need to have some, let's say, let's put it like this clout within the community, right? People need to trust you. People need to kind of recognize who you are or 
that person has uh, taken on responsibility in the kernel. I, I know if, if stuff breaks, that person is going to be around. I, I can rely on stuff being fixed. Um, and so it's sort of when you have crossed that threshold, I think, then it's much easier for people to say, okay, uh, this is something which we haven't done in the kernel before, and I can kind of see the benefits, but I can't really, I can't really analyze it myself, but I know that the guy who is pushing this, like, or the person who is pushing this, sorry, uh, I, I can trust that person. So I'm fine with, uh, with, with uh, pushing this uh, feature upstream. Um, and that means in the end, be, becoming a maintainer, uh, becoming a maintainer in Linux. And that's, that's not necessarily a, a job that a lot of people enjoy, I think. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, I think it's actually a very good point, especially about this. I think the community for people who are experts in exploits, I mean, the community exists, but the community is not connected to our community very much. And that's a problem. And maybe that's also, I think, what something which Brad has called out in, in a sense that these people, they exist, but they, they are they expected to be, like he, his point was that they expected to be paid and, and, and they're, they're in some other communities. and, and and we're not commenting much. And, and one, I mean, Jan is not scaling well for all of the, all of the needs that um, which we might. I have. don't know if this. If I don't, I don't personally know if it's fair to say that people. It, and I guess that that, that wasn't the there wasn't the whole point of uh, of this discussion. But um, I don't know if it's it's fair to say that these people just are in it are in it for the money. I think there are a lot of talented people out there who are really interested. Uh, in writing exploits just because they enjoy uh, breaking things or making things behave in a certain way that they don't expect them to behave. And a lot of, for a lot of them, I think it's it's more of sort of, if, if there's money in it, then that's probably fine. But I think that's not necessarily, I would think that's not necessarily the mindset that these people have the same way I don't have the mindset of developing new features uh, um, for money, but I, I did it because it's, I did it because it's fun. It's much more, um, it, it's, it's, I think this goes back to Andy's point. It's just not fun to review other people's code per se, right? I mean, you have to sit down and then like there is a patch series. It, it doesn't matter if it's on, on GitHub or GitHub or if it's a mailing list patch and you have to sit down, you have to look at this code, you have to stare at it, you have to understand what's going on. You maybe have to apply this patch to your tree to see the context of the patch and so on. And then you have to think about all of the cases where this can break. And it's just not, that's way less fun than sitting down and staring into assembly and making, uh, breaking hardware. That's way more fun. I think that's ultimately the problem. Convincing people that, both, that they need to do both. Yeah, very good point. Does anyone else want to comment? Uh, we also have, um, maybe we should also get back to our uh, queue. Uh, let's see. Oh, does anyone want to bring something out of queue from our panel members? I, I have a question for me specifically. Oh. Um, so it's about, uh, one second, it's about future of sanitizers, uh, the roadmaps or any plans that we have and in particular about uh, Havasan and RMMT. So RMMT is a, is a hardware technique that effectively gives you address sanitizer capabilities in, in CPU at very low cost. It uh, can protect from use of the free and out of bounds box. And we have very uh, large plans for it. And I think it will change landscape of, of this memory corruption exploitation very significantly because it can be simply enabled in production all the time and uh, so for arm it's it's already the specification is published and i hope we will see actual cpus with uh, mt uh, soon maybe within a year or so uh, and we definitely hope that other vendors will also uh, do something some, something similar in their cpus uh, following arm uh, then the next sanitizer that we have in plants is it's currently called KFANS or previously it was called GWIP ASAN. 
uh, I did presentation about it on the last plumbers and it's a tool that gives you uh, also uh, detection of use after free and out of bounds at literally zero cost, but with very low probability. So let's say we sample one out of I don't know, million allocations and detect bugs only on that allocation. Uh, and the idea is that you can deploy this to the whole fleet of, I don't know, data center or all of your devices or all of your, I don't know, I IoT devices or phones. Uh, and then this gives you the scale, uh, the, the probability back. So in the whole fleet, you can detect uh, all of the bugs that happen again. Uh, we also have future plans uh, for trying to do something similar for other bug types, for example, uh, probabilistic low rate detection for data races or for other types of undefined behavior. That's it. So I'm, I'm very excited to see control flow integrity become a widespread thing. Um, in the x86 land, we have Intel CET specification, which may or may not show up in computers near us sometime soon. And <clears throat> CET gives us strong integrity on return. It gives us very weak control flow integrity on indirect calls. And I would love to see some of the, especially LLVM efforts to build stronger control flow integrity combined with features like CET, give us something that is overall very strong. Um, unfortunately, I don't think anyone has even tried to write patches to make this work in the kernel. And doing so is going to be a mess because x86 is a mess. But someday this will happen. Does anyone want to comment on this? What's this? What's the status? I think I, I saw Case briefly speaking about this, but I didn't catch all of the the whole talk. What's the status? The status of CFI if it's going to be upstream soon? I think he was talking yesterday. This, but the status is Project Gold at least on 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 the Android side. I also didn't catch all the details on on the. So as far as I know, CFI is deployed in Android for some time now, uh, and for now it's in the process of being upstreamed and integrated, which is a long process, and it takes lots of fixing uh, and also um, doing uh, link time up full uh, link time optimizations, full kernel build as a, as a prerequisite. So it should happen reasonably soon it's in progress and i agree it's, it's a very so is, high um, bug technique as well so i think we have one more question i don't know if we have answered this does having an lkdtm test accompany a new hardening patch help in this regard reviewing acceptance i, uh, I think I just think having, having a having a test with every feature is kind of really what we want um it helps with it helps with any feature like if if i have a test that i can run or this i can verify a new feature that i see being upstream that's obviously pretty great and that's by the way i think to some extent also kind of a uh, i guess it's the way how you have been socialized with writing with writing patches but i see um especially from 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 my generation or younger generations people pushing patches upstream and they usually have tests they know that case self test exists that uh, linux kernel has some some test suites and so they, they usually send a patch a uh, test along and that's uh, extremely helpful because it gives you the confidence that the person not just uh, compile tested the change that they did but also uh, that they've actually written a test and verified that that change works so I think in, in general, this, this uh, just gives a lot more credibility to when you send the patch series. Okay, does anyone want to still comment or let's see what do you have else in the queue? Um... Okay, 
I wonder now that we have, I have a question. I wonder now that we have, for example, KC Sun, which is the newest uh, uh, feature that we related to, I guess, just call it. Um, if if uh, if this is going if this is going to be uh, like this is going to have a lot of impact um, in the kernel because I hear that there's like a lot of bugs that are sitting in a queue. Yes, there are lots of bugs, and the story with cases on is very difficult. Uh, so it's fine data races, and the problem is that kernel has lots and lots of what's called benign data races. And I take it in quotes because uh, from the point of view of the C standard, which is the language the kernel is written is any data race is undefined behavior. So it's very bad bug like use of the free. Uh, but in the kernel, they are considered benign. And so far, there is no agreement on removing all of them. So what happens with cases on it just traps on all of those well, kind of intentional data races that are not really considered as bugs by developers. And we have lots of those currently in the queue, and it's very hard to find actual harmful bugs there. And it's unclear also how can we deploy this on Sysbot because Sysbot is, is it has automat automated reporting. And if we will just start reporting all of those, then like, I think it will not be accepted well by majority of developers. And there's no way to filter only the harmful ones and also fixing them throughout the kernel is lots of work, especially um, while there is no kind of green light for, for eliminating all of those. Uh, because it, it currently it really depends on the subsystem. Some subsystems are much more welcome fixes for races and want to fix all of them and some subsystem like you then have lengthy discussion with the maintainer about the data races and they don't agree to take any fixes. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we know from, from address sanitizer that actually lots of the bugs, lots of the say use of the freeze and even out of bounds, they caused by data races. We see that, that because say, free happened in one task and access happened in the other task, or we see that it's not reproducible well, or we see that uh, it manifests differently. Uh, so most likely it's a data race. I would actually go as far as saying that data races are the major source of bugs in the kernel. So in the end, to like cases sun would be super, super uh, useful, but currently we can't take advantage of it. So we would need to, to figure out what to do with benign races. And like, if you're asking me, I would say that we need to, well, fix all of the benign races just because that will allow us to use the tool. So regardless, regardless of the standards and like, if they can really be har harmful or not, uh, we can just forget that and fix those just for the tool itself. So there is no, what you're saying is there is currently no consensus on what to do with benign data races. Yes. Okay. Let's see, I think we have mostly answered two questions. Uh, there's, there's one question about like what do we, People think about kernel security bug bounty, so paying researchers for proof of concept exploits. So we have discussed that there is like um, there is lack of interest, or maybe like not enough participation from exploit writers. But I don't know how can we possibly answer this question because this. So it's I guess it's a proposal to run a security bug bounty on Linux kernel itself. But um, I, I think the financing aspect of this is something. I don't know. If, I, I don't even understand how this would be run. So I don't know. Does anyone want to comment on this one? Uh, I think it again uh, conflicts somewhat with the number of bugs. So usually those programs run for projects that already do 
you know, they're best for testing, for fuzzing, and then there may be a few security bugs and it's reasonable to, to pay for those. And it's also harder to find, but today, say, if somebody takes hundreds of use of the freeze from Sysbot dashboard and copy paste them into the bug bounty submission form, like, and what if hundreds of people do the same? Yeah, I think here, here the, the idea would be not just the bugs, but you would actually write proof of concept explode and you would probably maybe, I mean, it doesn't have to be stupidly like anything accepted. You can kind of have to show that it's if Meek is new enough and then something like, you can try to make it more clever, but I still kind of don't know how far we can go with this. As, as far as I know, lots of uh, bug bounty programs say for Chrome, they don't require proof of concept. So you can get more money if you if you create full system exploit and actually prove, but they usually uh, pay for just use of the free because yeah. like it's it's too expensive to create full exploit and Okay, anyone else wants to comment? I don't know how we're doing in time because the show's one hour. Didn't we have just one hour? Uh, when is this supposed to end? Fifteen. So are we over time now already or? I think I would just bring one point um, where we had been, I think the Christian Christian brought this that that it's not easy to do review. It's not fun to review the patches, which I agree very much. So I think one of the things probably everybody can help with is like it's not easy to review actually, but it's probably easy to just take the patches and test them and ensure that even if somebody else has posted the patches for for a particular architecture, they can test and then make sure that it doesn't break their architecture and share their tested by. Uh, because that seems to be easier than actually re doing the review, but then it also ensures that there was somebody else had also tested on different architecture and one change did it impact something else or a new bugs are not actually got because of that. So probably people can actually contribute by doing more of testing the patches before even they are upstreamed or accepted. Yeah, thank you, man. I think this is actually a good point. And I think case is also usually on KCP list, he's, he's looking always for volunteers to test in different architectures. So that's really second set point. But I think we have a tough time now. So I would like to thank all the panel members for an interesting discussion and being with us today. And also for all people who have asked questions. And I'm going to hand it over to James to uh, for closure remarks. Thanks, Elena. Uh, can you hear me? You're able to hear me? Okay, getting some thumbs up. Okay, thanks. That was a really great discussion uh, uh, to close out there with. And, you know, I'd really like to thank uh, everyone, all of the attendees who are uh, online now. Uh, we've had really good attendance. We, during Brad's discussion this morning, we had over 300. Uh, and, you know, we've maintained well over 100 throughout the, uh, throughout the conference. Um, I'd like so, you know, people out there watching uh, later as well, thanks for, for checking this out. Um, uh, the, the speakers who put in proposals and went through all the processes for uh, and the uncertainties, thank you for that. Uh, a special thank you to all the panelists who joined. This is something we arranged the last minute and thought would be good uh, to try and make this a more collaborative and more of a conference uh, feel for something that is a virtual event. Uh, and a thank, great thank you to Alina, who I think has done an excellent job uh, shaping a, a really productive discussion. And we have a lot of the uh, really core people who really understand Linux security and who work in that every day participating. We've had a, a diversity of uh, input from, from uh, people slightly outside that group too, which I think is really important. Um, and I think, you know, there was some discussion at one point whether we were going to have this uh, conference at all this year due to uh, COVID. And I think that it's been important that people have been able to present the work that they've been working on and get that out to the community uh, for people to be able to ask questions and to have these discussions. Uh, so it's not uh, optimal. It's not as uh, good as uh, in person for many reasons. Um, but it also, I think, perhaps has allowed others to 
participate this year who may not have uh, been able to in the past. Uh, so this is something, you know, regardless of COVID status next year, we'll look at possible online participation. Um, and, you know, think about if that uh, continues to make sense. Uh, and I think also, you know, we have to be able to adapt to uh, the world changing. That is us, the, you know, the Linux uh, community and the security communities. Um, and in fact, you know, now it's possibly even more important uh, to be focused on security defenses, given uh, the amount of critical uh, functioning that has uh, been going online uh, through through COVID. Uh, certainly, you know, we're seeing reports of uh, attackers targeting companies and, and organizations and people that are, are, are now moving to much more uh, online work. Um, just to also mention that Linux Security Summit uh, Europe will be happening. Uh, the CFP is open uh, until the end of July, and I certainly encourage people to uh, still submit talks to that. Uh, Alina will be uh, running that conference as she has for the past couple of years. Uh, I'd like to thank Linux Foundation who were able to bring all of this together online, uh, especially uh, Gillian Hall, who really uh, takes the lead for us on the uh, Linux Security Summit, and Angela Brown, of course, who uh, heads up all of this, and Tricia and uh, all of the others uh, at Linux Foundation and the engineers that we've had working on this uh, today. So uh, with that, uh, I guess uh, you'll be able to review these videos and slides online uh, shortly after the event. Okay, uh, thanks to everyone and uh, hope to see you at the next conference.